Welcome those of you who join us on Facebook or on YouTube. If you're going to plan to join us this coming week, you can let us know. We'll make sure and leave a seat open for you. We would love to have you with us. I've not titled sermons in a long time, but the message today is titled, You Had One Job. You may be able to notice in that picture, if it ever comes out, am I locked out, locked up? There we go. You had one job. How many of you notice something's a little off maybe in that picture, right? You had one job. I've got a few other examples of that, and actually one of these is my absolute favorite in this day when you can define things as you want to. Someone decided that we're going to have a delay here, and I'll wait for it. Maybe we just paid part of our bill. Maybe our Wi-Fi is... There we go. Someone decided that the top crayon is a yellow crayon. The next one, that's a yellow crayon. The next one, that's a yellow crayon. Eventually, they're going to get it right, and sure enough, they found a yellow crayon. But in this day and age, you know, you can define anything how you want. There's nothing apparently written in stone, and that would include colors as well. And again, it's another title, you had one job. I'm going to have to do these several ahead. This one, if you go into Memorial Day weekend, is labeled as hot dog buns. Instead, we see, if you look closely, these are hamburger buns. Be careful what you pick, because again, even apparently even bread can re-identify as to what it wants to actually be. I'm going to click the next one, and then we're going to be done because I can't continue to lag like this. It's, I promise you, it's the, I'm guessing it's the prince of the air. And now he's going to shut us down altogether, and it was one of the better ones. We got it. One. All right, here we are. This one, apparently the person ordered a fish sandwich with cheese on the side. <laughs> now understand our government, our administration is wanting to pay these people $15 an hour. I don't think that's the way that it's actually going to work. So you have to be extra clear when you order. And this one is my absolute favorite. I'll have to read it for you. It said, you had one job, and obviously you couldn't handle it. All right, that's the only dad joke I promise in the home service. You had one job. In the past weeks, we've looked at the actions of Jesus between Resurrection Sunday and what is coming up this Sunday. And what Sunday is coming up? What's next Sunday? Pentecost. Very good. If you're a Pentecostal people, lowercase p, I would hope that you would know that. So we're looking at the actions of Jesus between Resurrection Sunday and Pentecost. It's a total of 50 days in there. 40 days Jesus was here walking among everyone on the earth. We saw where a group of 500 even saw him alive. He spent a lot of time with the disciples. And then he left for 10 days, and he told him, he said, look, go and tarry in Jerusalem. I have a promise for you. And that promise is fulfilled in the Holy Spirit, which came down at Pentecost. Today, specifically, I want to look at the last words of Jesus here on earth and the one job we as Christians are given. Turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Some of you already know where I'm going. Matthew chapter 28. We're going to be in verses 16 through 20. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And Acts chapter 1 verse 8 goes along with that. It says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and the end of the earth. 
These comprise what we call the Great Commission. And in the margin of Bond Bible at some point I wrote that the Great Commission in Matthew tells us what we need to do. And then it tells us in Acts how we're going to do it. It breaks down the entire world that you're going to go ahead. It breaks it down to the here, the there, and the yonder. If I came up with a redneck, I guess, translation of the scriptures, what Jesus said, he said, you're going to start here and you're going to go there, and then you're going to go yonder, which we know is farther than there. We understand that. That's anything farther north than Shreveport and anything farther east than the Mississippi River and anything farther west than where the sun sets on Texas. Anywhere and everywhere. He said, I want you to go everywhere. But he said, where do I want you to start? I want you to start where? Here. Start here. There's a saying that says, bloom where you're planted. There's no reason why not to start right here whenever you begin to spread the gospel. Commission, when we talk about the Great Commission, commission is not a word used greatly anymore. When we think about commission now, we think about in sales. You're paid, you get a commission, a portion of every sale. If you've sold a house recently or bought a house recently, there's a buyer's commission or a seller's commission because eventually we try and get everything back to money. But that was not the intent when it was laid out. Some of you who have served in the military, as I have, you realize that the, the, you hear the word commission, a commissioned officer, or a non-commissioned officer, an NCO. I was in the National Guard, but I was offered enrollment when I was in college in ROTC. And part of that was that whenever I stayed with them and took what they had to offer, that at the end of the three years, four years, I would be commissioned. Well, I turned that down because part of the commission requirement was that I would have had to stay in for eight years. And realize when you're 20 years old, eight years is a lifetime. I'm like, no, there's no way I'm not going to be able to do that for that long. I'm not going to commit for that long. So I turned down my commission. We as Christians, uh, we accept a commission from Christ Jesus that is lifelong. It is eternal. We are not being able to, to opt out. Once we opt in, then we should be opted in. Now understand, we can pull ourselves out. We can say, no, I'm out. Don't ever forget that. We choose to stay in. We choose to serve. We choose to obey. We make that choice on our own. We do that. And it is not because of anything God has done or a lack of his faithfulness. It is us. We choose to leave. We see it every day. We can close our eyes and see people that were in these pews that are no longer here with us anymore. And I'm not talking about those who passed away. I'm talking about those who decided that they elected that there was something else to do. I almost put a post on Facebook this morning. It's not on my nose. I almost put a Facebook post. I was going to say, okay, I'm, I'm exploring my options. What do I need to be doing on Sunday morning instead of going to church? I want to know what all these people are doing on Sunday mornings that is so much better than being in the presence of God. I honestly want to know. I want to see their answers. I want to see what trumps being in God's presence. What is greater than what God has to offer here? I want to know. I really want to know. But like a lot of things, I type it all out and then what? I hit delete. I said, no, no, because I'm going to get a thousand different answers and a thousand different this, that. And I said, no, forget it. You know, sometimes the best way to avoid a fight is just not getting the fight, and it wasn't worth it. I'm not going to die on that hill. But I guess if they watch this, they had the question asked to them. In exchange for enlisting in man's army or even God's army, you know, you come in and you, you take an oath, you, you take a vow. And there's, given in that, there's a list of expectations. Like I said, I turned them down because of the eight years. But in this list of expectations, there are things that were given. Whenever you, when you choose to accept that commission, when you choose to go in, there are certain tools that you're going to be given. You're going to be given instruction. You're going to be given the training materials. And you're going to be given a clear objective. Now, as you go through in the military, sometimes your clear objective may not be clear to you, but hopefully it's clear to someone but you should be given a clear mission. This is what you are here to do. Whenever we went to Grace's graduation last week, 
One of the young men who was graduating from college was receiving his commission in the Air Force. And his colonel came up and he was administered the oath of office. And his oath of office was that he was there to protect the, the nation and protect the Constitution. That was an expectation. That was what he was swore to do. That was his clear objective, to protect. God has given us our objective, and we looked at it a little bit earlier, Matthew 28, but specifically in 19. When Jesus told us what our objective is, this is what you have to do. This is like if he told you, I want you to go take that hill, go take that mountain. This is what he told you. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. Everyone in here is commanded to be able to disciple, to baptize, and to teach. Disciple, baptize, and teach. Every one of you, everyone who signed up for God's army is commanded to disciple. They're commanded to baptize. They're commanded to teach. Sometimes it seems like, oh, we opted in just to have a place to go sit in a comfortable pew in the air conditioner. It seems to me that some people, they think that's all their calling was. I don't see them creating disciples. I don't see them baptizing. I do not see them teaching. Whenever we went into the military, we were given training manuals. Everything that we did as far as PT, running, jumping, hiking, all of these things, most of our time that wasn't spent in it, most of our time was sitting in a classroom hearing somebody drone on and on and on and on about this regulation, that regulation. You go into AIT, advanced training, and you're going to talk about this, and you're about this, and it's over and over and over. It's so repetitive. It's so repetitive. It's over and over and over again to learn this, these books this thick. Well, let me tell you, we're given our training manual. It's right here. This is your training manual. It's not dull. It's not repetitive. It is the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. This is your basic instructions. Just like if you were in basic training. These are your basic instructions before leaving earth. B-I-B-L-E. This is what we have. When I went into the army, I got a uniform. Maybe a little smaller than, than this one, but um, they gave me a uniform. But you know what? God's given us battle gear also. I had the honor of Friday night of preaching the, uh, the wedding, officiating the wedding up in Natchitoches, of a, a, of a brand new Marine. He had just come out of basic training and waiting his assignment, and just finished his training. Brand new Marine. And he had him there and he had his young bride, and he was in his dress uniform, standing at attention at my side. He was so resolute. He was actually at parade rest. Let me rephrase that. It's been a while. He was actually standing like that at the end of the aisle. Didn't make a single motion on his face, nothing at all. Now, I knew I'd already been told he was going to be in his full dress uniform, which meant I had to be in a suit, which meant that I had to break a vow. I stood before the bride and groom and all these 200 people and said, before I begin this service, I need to let you know that I stand here as a pastor who has broken a vow. And they all kind of quiet. I said, I have broken a vow. I have broken a promise. I said, I do not do outdoor weddings in Louisiana in months that do not contain an R. I said, even April is suspect. I said, I stand by that rule so highly that I would not even allow my own two daughters to have outside weddings in the summer. It was 95 degrees. But I knew I'd already been told it was a military wedding. That boy would be there in his full suit, and he'd be right there standing in the same sunshine that I was standing in. I'm like, okay, I'll be there. And I stood there, and I commanded my sweat not to drop, and he did the same thing, and he stood there, and he was just like that locked on. And they pulled back a curtain in the back, and his bride stepped through that curtain, and I watched this young Marine as the tear ducts begin to swell. Now, he did not cry, all right? I can testify that he did not cry, but I don't know how he held him back. And that smile kept twitching at the edges of his mouth, and the little tear ducts were swelling, his eyes were getting red, but he wasn't going to crack. And I began to watch him, I began to think of what about the 
Everything we fight through here, everything we've signed up for here, everything is so worth it when we come to the marriage supper of the Lamb. When we are joined to Christ as His bride, everything we've done, everything was worth it. Everything was worth it. Standing in the sun, sweating, going through all these things, everything at the expense of a wedding, all of these things. At that moment when that bride began to come down the aisle, everything was worth it. Everything was worth it. I began to think about this song, I can only imagine, you know. And as I was like, I can only imagine how it's going to be at that moment. How do, how do we react? What are we going to do? I think tears of joy will be very appropriate on that day. My young Marine standing there who was in his dress uniform. I was thankful that apparently Marine uniforms are not dressed, aren't wool anymore. They were something close to it, but I saw him there and he was in his dress uniform and he had the white gloves and the white hat. And, but you know, they also, when he went to the Marines, they also would have given him a BDUs, his battle dress uniform, his camouflage, that which he goes to war in. You know, we're given that too as soldiers of the cross. We're given that. We're given a uniform fit for battle. And we read that in Ephesians chapter 6. I'm not going to break it down completely, but in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 through 17, Paul says to us, he said, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having all to stand firm, you do what? Stand. When you've stood all you can stand, you do what? You stand, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Whenever we read this, and we've been told before that the one thing that holds all of that armor together is the belt of truth. I passed her in a church this year that voted and decided that they were going to turn away from the path that they were on because they were not on a path of truth. I pray that every church wakes up to that if they are sitting under a pastor or sitting under an organization that is not bound by truth. Because literally you are going to be caught with your pants down, for lack of a better term, if you don't belt yourself up with truth. When it comes time for to go to battle, you can't run like that with your pants around your, your ankles. You've got to be ready. And there is a battle coming. I hope you understand that. We go out with explicit orders. There is complete clarity in what God has given us to do. Make disciples. We've been given all we need to know in this Bible. We're sufficiently dressed in his armor. And there's only one last thing to know. The great commission. The command of God. What he has told us we have to do, we must do. It is literally listed as a co-mission. You don't have to do this alone. Christ is there. He told us what? And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I am with you always. Say that. He is with me always. Say that. He is with me always. We're told in the Old Testament, if I lay down in heaven, you're with me. If I lay down in hell, you are with me. He is always with us. This is a commission. We are sent out with him. We do not fight alone. And make no mistake, we are in a fight. So many people are so thick. Oh, the, 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 the church, they're so militaristic, all these things. We're in a fight. I hope you see that. If you've got children and grandchildren, I especially hope you realize that you are in a fight. You have an enemy that has concentrated themselves on your children. If they can't kill them in the womb, they want to try and destroy them in the church. They're going to tell you that they're going to try and tell themselves that they're not what they say they are. They were created in the image of God, man and woman, male and female. They're going to say, oh, no, you're not that. You're this, this, and the other. No. 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 The enemy cannot have my children. I hope you pray that every day. Paul told the Ephesians, he said, we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. So many people say, oh, the church, they're so 
down. They're, they're, they're doing all this. They're saying all this. They hate, they hate, they hate. No, no, no. We don't hate people. The old saying used to be, we don't hate the sinners. We, 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 we hate the sin. Love the sinners. Hate the sin. Whatever how all that was. It, it, it's, it's real simple, though. You know what it is? It boils down to this fact. Lost people do lost things. Lost people do lost things. How can I be upset with them when they are lost? Instead, I need to show them something. What do I need to show them? You know what I need to show them? Damn, my notes, but it just dawned to me. What I need to show them is that you're on the wrong path and you need to turn. That's what we do. You see this? But we need to tell them to turn the right way. But sometimes we as Christians send them mixed messages. I'm telling them to turn right, but yet they see me always over here to the left. I tell them, you know what? You can't do all these things that you're doing. And they see them at where? At the casino. They see them drinking. And no, no, you're not supposed to do all that. Well, yeah, you can do it, but you, you can't become drunk. Well, when do you become drunk? At what point do you become drunk? Well, I, I don't know. Well, let me tell you what point it becomes adultery. It's, Jesus said it becomes adultery if you look upon a woman and have the thought. So is, when is drunkenness? Is it when you think about getting drunk or when you pop the first beer, the second beer? Is it the eighth beer? When, when do you cross over into that line? You know the easiest way? Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't send the people mixed messages. I told you before that the biggest thing and the biggest source of atheism in this country is Christians who say one thing and then do something else. Man, I wasn't even in my notes. We are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. We're fighting against evil rulers. We fight against authorities of the unseen world. We fight against mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. That's who your enemy is. Your enemy is Satan. It's not, your enemy is not the people who have been deceived. Those are your mission field. When he says, go make disciples... Do you go make disciples from disciples? No. You make disciples from the lost who've been converted. Go ye. That's all he's telling you to do. Well, he said, well, you know what? No, that's not all Jesus told us to do. People get over into the social gospel. They say we're supposed to feed the poor. We're supposed to clothe the naked. We're supposed to visit those in prisons. We're supposed to do this. We're supposed to do that. You know what? You're right. And if you're making disciples, then you are doing that because you are showing them by your actions what it means to be a disciple. If you are making disciples, if you are being a Christian example, then yes, you're going to do all those other things. I've got to tell you one thing. When you sign up for the Lord's army, when you sign up to be with him, you have a commander-in-chief that you can trust. Now, I'm not saying anything political today, but I am telling you, and when that young man took the oath last week at the graduation and that young Marine that's standing right there beside me, I'm not necessarily saying that they can say I have a commander-in-chief that I can trust. I have a commander-in-chief that I can trust. I do not doubt his mental faculties. I do not doubt the decision-making authority of Jesus Christ. I know that I serve a commander who has the best interest of himself, his kingdom. I put those things first. You know, before a dangerous mission, you write a letter to your family in the military. I only had to do that one time. I think they just wanted us to keep us busy, to be honest. It was before a live fire drill. And they had, they just write that letter because I mean there's a lot of bullets going over, accidents happen. They said, go ahead and write your letter, write it and seal it up. And we gave it to our, our drill sergeant to hold. And we we wrote these letters, and it would be very simple. But what you wanted your family to know if something actually happened to you. And I don't know if you know it or not, but Paul kind of did the kind of did the same thing in Second Timothy chapter four and verse seven. Many of you know what Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 7. says, what, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, and I have kept the faith. Very simple. That's what Paul would have wanted everyone to know. 
I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now, John MacArthur, me and him don't line up on everything, but I like how he paraphrased that verse. He said, I did what the Lord asked me to do, and that's all I can do. I did what the Lord asked me to do, and that's all I can do. When your days wrap up here, can you say that? Can your family honestly have that put on your obituary or put on your tombstone? I did what the Lord asked me to do, and that's all I can do. I'm asking you today, have you done what the Lord asked you to do? Have you done what the Lord has asked you to do? The first thing he asked you to do, he told you, he said, those who are lost, those who carry burdens, come unto me. Have you done that? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? That's the very first thing that you have to do. The very first thing he has asked of you is to come unto him. When you stand before God on that day, and everyone will stand, and everyone will kneel, I want you to remember this. You had one job. You had one job. I've got 90-something employees, and we're doing job evaluations in the month of June. Everybody gets a job evaluation. You know, the job evaluations are normally from one to five. Now, I had one of my supervisors one year, one of his employees, come to me crying. She said, I can't believe this. I said, why? She gave, said, he gave me all ones. I'm like, I don't, I don't know. Let me go find out because I knew her to be a good employee, but I don't override my supervisor. So I said, I need to talk to you about this employee. Why are we keeping her if she's a number one? He said, she's number one. She's great. I said, that's our lowest rating. Oh, I didn't know. I said, you might want to catch your other employees. Let me tell you, though, God does not judge on a curve, and God does not use a one through five on his grading. I had someone send me a message just this year. To explain to me that this month, I'm shoot. This week, ooh, they all run together. Somebody sent me a text this week, explain to me the levels of heaven. I'm like, oh, good night. I said, the only thing I can understand is that there's a specific level in heaven for those people who drive slow in the left lane, <laughs> those people who do not flush public toilets. I know that sounds rough. Those people who do not return their shopping carts maybe to the store. No. Heaven has but two things whenever you come to see your evaluation. We find the first in Matthew. Well, they're both in Matthew, but the first we find the 25th verse. And it says what? You remember the words? It says, well done, good and faithful servant. And the only other thing in your evaluation can be, depart from me. You who act wickedly. This is from the Amplified disregarding my commands, says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who did not obey my commands. How many do we have? One. You got one job. Go forward make disciples. There should be no one sitting by themselves in this church, and we said that for Mother's Day, but I'm talking about the fact that the people that you brought to church, that you disciple, they need to be right here with you. They need to be with you, and they need to be learned so they can go out and make disciples. Disciples make disciples make disciples. That's how we grow. That's how the kingdom of God grows. That's how God decided to do it, not me. It's not the way I would have done it. It's the way God decided to do it. You're either going to hear, well done, or depart from me. And one of the worst parts in that Matthew 7, 23, it says what? It says, I never knew you. One of the worst things you can have in the military is when you go before them and they, they literally, they rip your stripes off. They take away your, they take away your rank and you're, 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 you're broke down to nothing. But the only thing worse than that is if they take your name badge and they rip it off. You're nothing. They take away your name. They take away the branch of the service that you're on. You're nothing. We never knew you. We never knew you. You say, oh, I went through basic. I put years in. I did all these things. I fought for my country. I did all these things. I sweat. I did all these things. But yet at the end, I never knew you. You can occupy a pew in this church for years. You can teach Sunday school. You can teach Bible school. I don't know what you are. You can come to work days even. But at the end, God can say, I didn't know you. Because you disobeyed my command. My command was to make disciples questions I have for you today are, have you obeyed his commands? Have you accepted the commission? 
Are you sharing the gospel with others and are you seeing fruit? Are you making disciples? You have one job. Now, don't ever get me wrong. I, it's, it's my one job, too. My job is not to be, just to be pastor. My job is to spread the gospel. My job is to be able to produce disciples. And I'm thankful that I've seen that. And I've seen disciples that have created, create, and make disciples. That don't mean I stop with one. I don't stop with two. I don't stop with three. I don't stop with any of those that I've done in the past. I'm continually, every week, under the same unction and command that you are. The altars are open today. You may choose to re-enlist or you may sign up for the very first time. For the very first time, you may accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. You may, for the very first time, become a member of the body of Christ, the family of Christ. You know, Memorial Day is coming up this weekend. And Memorial Day is when we remember those who gave their life for their country. But the question I have to ask is, have you given your life for your Savior? Have you given your life for Christ? Have you given your life in service to Christ? Have you given everything? Have you poured out everything? Have you withheld nothing? And remember, you don't go out alone. And next week is Pentecost Sunday. And we're going to look specifically at the fact that you go out with the Holy Spirit who's given to us not only as a comforter but as a teacher. He said he will remind you of the things that you have known. You'll see what the Holy Spirit brings to this fight. But you know what? There's another great reason to come to church on Sunday mornings. You have us. We are all together in this battle. We are all together. Every one of us. You know, I'll never forget when I was, when I was serving. I was in basic training for sure. I had a battle buddy. Half of what I needed, he carried. We, I carried half a tent. He carried half a tent. I would carry this. He would carry that. And we were together. We would go out. And Christ Jesus, when he sent us apostles, he sent them out. How out? Two by two. I don't have everything. I don't know everyone you know. You don't know everyone I know. I don't know all, all the scriptures you may know. You may know a lot more than I know. But with the two of us together, we have a pretty good opportunity to be able to know what needs to be said at the time that it's needed. We need to do that more often. I want to start us this summer a concentrated evangelistic push out into our communities. We need to know what to say. We need to know what it is when we encounter these people. But we don't have to do it alone. In Hebrews, we're told what? Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, that is you, to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. Come to the altars today and accept your marching orders. It may be the first time or you may come to re-enlist. But I need to know that you're ready to follow the commands that have been given to you. That you're ready to put on the armor of God. That you go ye into the world, but you go prepared. If there be any here that they've never said, You know what, God, I surrender. I surrender. I want to serve you. Then today is the day for that. I'd love to pray with you. No, but there may be in here that, you know what, it's just time to make a new commitment to re-enlist, to sign up and make those vows and those oaths again. Lord God, I'm here to serve you. Father God, I have not done what I needed to do to enlarge your kingdom. Father God, I have disobeyed your commands. Father God, forgive me and lead God and direct me into the truth. Put me to service, Lord God. I'm reporting for duty. The altars are open this morning. We're not going to stay here forever, but we're going to give an opportunity and a time for the Holy Spirit to work on those here that are in need.
Father God, we come before you as a church. We come before you, Lord God, en masse, as it were. As a platoon, as a company, as a regiment, Lord God, of your people. We come before you and we, even now, Lord God, repent. That we have not done everything that we could do as a church to be able to bring new souls into your kingdom. Father God, we haven't done everything we could to disciple those souls. But Lord God, from today I make a vow that we change. We, Father God, as a congregation, as a body of believers, Lord God, we re-enlist. We once more become focused upon the intention that you have set aside for us, the command, Lord God, that you have given us to go ye. Father God, we can't just stay in this building and wait for people to come to us. That's not what you commanded, Lord God. You have told us, go ye. And Father God, that is the commitment that we make today. Lord God, give us the strength. Give us, Lord God, the wisdom and discernment. Lord God, give us the opportunities to be able to share your word in our communities. Lord God, I proclaim even now that we go forward to be able to take this land in your name. Father God, it's not for our pride or for our privilege, but Lord God, it's only to grow your kingdom. Father God, your blessings upon all of these here, Lord God, who by their actions have said that they are ready to go forth. By their actions, Lord God, they have said that they are ready to go forward. And I pray, Lord God, that even now we send them out in the name of Jesus. Father God, have your hand upon them. Bless them. Strengthen them. All these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go forth. Go ye, as the scriptures say. But come back next Sunday.